I think it is uh, time to start. Um, my name is Anna Feld. I'm uh, heading the Women's Empowerment Principal Secretariat, and I'm very excited about today's conversation. We will have a brief presentation of the recently launched uh, Transparency and Accountability Framework for uh, our web signatories. And then we will have a conversation with three web signatories that have done great work uh, linked to accountability and transparency from different perspectives. And, uh, and then we will have an opportunity for questions and answers at the end. So um, we have chosen this topic, as many uh, of you are aware, we've been using the WEPS gap analysis tool for a few years as a self-assessment tool. And I think that at, a, at this point in time, uh, a lot of things are changing and uh, there is more pressure, I think, uh, from everyone to be more transparent and show progress towards gender equality. So from our side, uh, from UN Women and UN Global Compact, we've been working on this transparency and accountability framework that we are now asking companies to step up and show what they've been doing to implement the women's empowerment principles. And you will learn a little bit about that today. Um, we go with, a, with the slogan, what gets measured gets done. Um, and we will hear that from all of our speakers today, uh, that they've been able to not only make progress, but know where they stand in the gender equality. We have uh, currently over uh, 4,600 web signatories, and I think 10% um, of them have already stepped up and been given some indication of what they're doing on three indicators, which is that percentage of women um, in their companies, women in leadership, and women on boards. But we would like to uh, take a step further to go into some other indicators that really can be transformative for companies and, and for women and men working in those companies and in their supply chain. Uh, we will be recording this session and we will be posting it on the web's uh, website. Um, and we will, apologies, um, we will uh, post it on the web's website and uh, also disseminate it in the next web's newsletter so that everyone can take advantage of this conversation today and the insights from our, our signatories that will. Uh, be part of the conversation. So um, I will hand it over to my colleague Diana Raniola to take us through briefly what this transparency and accountability framework is about. And then we will go into an exciting conversation uh, with our representative from Relix, Swedbank and FinDev Canada. So over to you, Diana. Um, thank you, Anna, and it's so great to be in here and um, really excited to hear about this conversation on transparency and accountability. Um, but before we do that, we're just going to give a very short presentation on the women's empowerment principles. Um, I know that most of you who are web signatories are familiar with the webs, so, but we're just going to give a slight overview. And there are seven principles, as you know, um, that help, that are framework for um, you know, for how it is that um, how companies can promote gender equality and women's empowerment in the workplace, marketplace, and leadership, and through the seven principles, um, that's how they kind of like I guess you know they're they're kind of like um, that's that's how they're made made up. So WEPS one is on leadership, which is on women on boards, executive leadership, and senior management. Um, principles two to four are focused on the workplace. What do companies do to help treat women fair, women and men fairly in the workplace? Um, and then there's also like ensuring the health, safety, and well-being of women, um, and also promoting education, training, and promote of women um, at the workplace. Um, and then Web 5 or Principle 5 focuses on the marketplace, which is, um, you know, how do companies interact with their suppliers and um, what do they need to do to ensure that your marketing and supply chains help empower women. Web 6 focuses on the community, which is an advocacy and um, other community initiatives that promote gender equality. And lastly, it's on transparency, which is on reporting and measuring the results. And that is the focus of today's presentation. Um, the web's journey is what guides the companies or what most companies go through as you go um, 
from the moment that they learn about the webs to the time that they implement and to the time that they report. And, you know, while there are like six phases in here, like companies can be there, like, you know, at different times or, um, how do I say this? It's like companies could be there at like different stages and they may not happen simultaneously, but you know, like these are more or less, what are the things that you go through? First step is to consider or the first phase where companies learn about the webs and are interested to sign it and what it is about, what are the eligibility criteria, um, to be part of the webs, um, to be a web signatory. And then the next is to sign, which is to sign the CEO statement of support. The third one is an activating, which is about really what are some of the processes that companies can do to start really implementing the webs, and that's usually through the action plan. Most of you would have heard by now of the gen or most of us are familiar of the gender analysis, gender gap analysis tool, which is um, a very useful self-assessment so that companies can know where they are. 18 questions to help you determine what it is that you need to do to help you determine what the next steps are and how to frame your action plan. Um, the fourth step or the fourth phase is on engage. And this is kind of like where companies start to work with other stakeholders, external, whether it's with other web signatories to their suppliers or their community. So this in a way is like webs uh, principles five and six. Um, and then the phase five is on sustaining, and this is where companies start working on their key performance indicators. So while ideally at the activate phase, um, companies would have um, determined what are some of the um, indicators, we do sometimes note that it's also like some would have to, um, you know, come up with activities first and then determine the KPIs later. But basically through sustain, through the monitoring of the work and tracking, this is kind of like how we know where the progress is, what are the ways into which, um, you know, what are the way, what are the, some of the things that have been done that have been successful and what are some of the things that do need improvement. And finally on reporting, which is where we report or where companies report on the progress made on indicators. And now we have it on the webs.org, um, a platform where you can, you can actually report on these indicators. And then lastly, there's reactivate, which kind of like shows the journey continues and um, it, it's a continuous um, process. And just so you know that there are different tools that are available to guide you throughout um, the web journey. Moving along, these are like the indicators um, that we have um, recently um, launched. Um, so there are eight essential indicators, and these are basically the ind indicators that measure sustainable change towards gender equality. And these are the things, if you're a web signatory and are approved and have created your company profile page, you can actually now start reporting on these online, whether publicly or privately. And, you know, this is voluntary, of course, but, you know, just so you know that they're there, there's a means to do that. And then there are, of course, like eight complementary indicators, which are indicators that measure key areas um, to tackle systemic barriers to gender equality, noting that these may vary according to country, industry, and company size. There are 27 input and support measures indicators, which basically tracks policies, practices, and measures that are available to help achieve gender equality and women's empowerment. And then there are lastly 24 additional indicators, which are a little bit more like disaggregated um, and well useful to have. We just want to focus on the um, the focus really for at least for the reporting platform is on the eight essential indicators. So here we are over here, we've listed them down. These are available in the web's brochure, which was um, published on Friday um, last week. And um, it basically shows like the percentage of women and men employees in senior management positions on boards, et cetera, et cetera. The first seven, these are basically outcome-based indicators, which shows um, you know, the percentage of women and men, the disaggregation of um, the information and whatnot. And then the last one is really more a question of whether there's a procedure on um, responding to allegations of um, sexual harassment and violence. 
So this is how it looks like on the company profile page if you wish to report it, just to kind of see, as you can see, like there's some way to kind of like report which ones you'd like to put out publicly or privately. Um, and it's pretty straightforward. And lastly, these are just like some of the con um, some of the sources that we have and the web's for sure. And um, we hope that you will access them so that it can help you um, with implementing the webs. And with that, I would like to turn over to back to Anna um, so that we can start the discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Diana. And I think that was a great overview on where we are today uh, on the web's journey and the resources that we put together. So I would like to introduce our three uh, web signatories. We have Marcia Valisciano, who is the founding global head of corporate responsibility at Relex. We have Mikael Nystrøm, uh, who is the head of compensation and benefits at uh, Swedbank. And we have Anne-Marie Levet, um, who is the head of gender and impact at FinDev Canada. And they all three have a story to tell. So if we switch off the um, screen share, then I'd like to ask uh, Marcia first to talk a little bit about what prompted Relics to start collecting uh, gender statistics and, and data disaggregated by sex. Uh, you're muted. Okay, I think there is a, a sound issue. Um, so let's see if we can uh, maybe start with Nikel uh, responding to the same question. What prompted as uh, Swedbank to start collecting this data? So I hope you hear me. Does it work? Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So um, how did our journey start? Um, um, there are several aspects to that one. One being that we are a bank located in, in Sweden and uh, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania and Baltics. Uh, and uh, in Sweden, uh, we have half of our, all our employees. So that's our, our major uh, country of employment. Um, and in Sweden, we have a long history of, of legal requirement to actually measure and report on equal salaries. Uh, this uh, has been a legal requirement for, for quite some time and it, it was a requirement to happen every third year. Um, our board of directors and uh, the group executive committee, although were in, ag in agreement that we needed to move faster um, and we need to, to have a more frequent control on this as well to take appropriate actions for, uh, when needed. So it was a decision taken um, to set up targets both in terms of equal salaries uh, and also improve the, the gender equal representation and increase diversity uh, to define targets for the entire company as well as uh, um, uh, use targets for each of the business areas in the bank going forward. So we needed a good model to measure this uh, and uh, to be able to do it more frequently. Uh, when you do it every third year, it becomes very much like a project. It's like a, a new start every time you do it, so to say. It, it takes time and effort, and uh, you tend to, to lose a bit of a momentum uh, when you're not doing it on a regular basis. So by setting up a, a, a more solid data structure um, and to do this more frequently uh, that speeds up the process for us and, and uh, really brings uh, more value to to the whole process of, of measuring this following it up. Great. Th thank you so much for that. And, and we'll go back to Marcia if, if you can unmute. Uh, but I think it's a great point that it's not just a one off or every time there's a requirement if this, after three years that you start a new project to collect the data, but the continuum actually helps you drive uh, not only results, but knowing where you are on, on the journey. So thanks thanks for that. Uh, Marcia? 
Um, yes, so, well, thank you very much for this opportunity to present uh, alongside my distinguished panelists. Uh, we're really passionate about the WEPS because it's created for us a, a way of charting our progress on gender equality. And um, let me just say that Relics, uh, we think of ourselves as the world's knowledge company and we have 33,000 employees operating in 40 countries around the world. Um, and we're committed to universal sustainable access to information and, and using our resources and skills to make a positive impact on society. And we have um, a, an inclusion um, policy which commits us to having a diverse workforce and an environment that respects all individuals. So um, it's got to be a place where women can thrive. And in order to understand um, how we are doing that, we've got to have the data. Anna, as you said, um, if you don't measure, then you really can't make progress. So we, we need those baselines. And um, one of the things that we have tried to do is to integrate a way of tracking data on a real-time basis into our HR information system so that managers can get access to that information when they need it. So we do that based on age, gender, seniority in the business, um, their function, by country, by ethnicity. Um, so it also integrates attrition so that we can see what's happening in terms of those types of metrics. Um, and you know, it's, uh, it's, it's helped us to know that we don't have to wait till we get to the end of the year to measure our progress. We really should be looking at this throughout time. Just to kind of set the baseline for where we are, we're 51% women, 43% um, managers who are women, um, and we are 31% uh, senior women in leadership, and we have 45% uh, women on the board. So the 31%, uh, we've been kind of constant at that level over the last uh, few years, and so that's a really big push for us. And I think the, the focus on measurement goes along with setting our aspirations, and for the first time last month, in our corporate responsibility report, we set um, a new suite of inclusion goals for the organization. Um, and this includes on gender to increase the percentage of women in management, senior leadership, and technology roles continually over time. And as I heard one of my colleagues from the Global Compact India say last week, um, you know, we should be aiming to get to planet 50-50. Thank you so much. And Anne-Marie, you come at it from a little different perspective. So, of course, you are a web signatory as, as Findes Canada, but you also use the women's empowerment principles as a tool. So how did you get started on this? Yeah, thanks, Anna. That's a, that's a great question and a pleasure, pleasure to be here today with you. Um, so Finda Canada is Canada's uh, bilateral development finance institution. So we invest uh, in private sector companies in um, the emerging markets of Latin America, the Caribbean and sub-Saharan Africa with a view to generate impact. So we come at it from the, from the investor uh, perspective, as well as web signatories ourselves. Um, and when FinDev Canada was founded in 2018, uh, from the get-go, we had a clear mandate to invest to generate impact on women's economic empowerment. Um, and around shortly afterwards, shortly after our creation, we actually joined um, and were founding members of the 2X Challenge, uh, which uh, started as an initiative of the uh, development finance institutions of the G7 countries uh, to commit and mobilize unprecedented amounts of capital to invest in women. Um, so very early on, with all these uh, clear goals and mandates and, and challenges that we took on, uh, the question was going to be, all right, so how will we know that we have an impact or uh, how will we measure our impact? So this is where data <laughs> really takes uh, all, all its importance. And as an investor, it has this interesting particularity that it's not only about our data, but it's also, of course, through our investees' uh, data. A lot of our data collection and uh, impact monitoring depends on uh, our investees' capacity to um, to track uh, these indicators. So uh, that's uh, that's the perspective that uh, that we bring and, and how we work with our investees. And I, I can talk more to this later. But um, another thing I wanted to, to mention how we come at it from an investor perspective is, of course, on, on the impact side, 
but frankly, on the on the business performance side as well, as an investor, we want our client companies, our investees to, to be successful. Uh, and we've seen firsthand, and I've seen firsthand in my previous experiences, how good data, including on gender, can be a driver of good business performance. Uh, Marcia alluded earlier to uh, data around uh, retention, attrition, uh, you know, pay gap, uh, salary. You know, th this can all lead to um, lead to uh, business decisions uh, and um, have an impact on the bottom line. You know, if you have an attrition problem, this results in additional cost for your business. So, uh, we are firm believers in the fact that. Um, good data, including on gender dynamics within the business, uh, is just good business, uh, full stop. That was a, a, a good uh, point there, uh, Anne-Marie. So going back to you, uh, Marcia, and if you could tell us a little bit more maybe on, on the dashboard that you are allowing you to um, see the progress lifetime um, and, and how that has been helping you to drive this progress. I, you already mentioned these great figures of 51% um, uh, uh, women, I think you said, in the company and 43% uh, of women in leadership. So can you tell a little bit more about the dashboard that you're using to, to measure this? Yeah, well, we also kind of need to dig into the data. We're, we are a business that employs about 9,000 technologists. Um, so uh, as you saw um, in that goal I mentioned, to increase the number of women in technology, we're also tracking that as well. You know, how many women in tech do we have? And um, as of last year, we were about 26% women in tech. So, um, you know, that's a, that's a point um, on the, the map, but we need to be able to increase that. And so, We've been working very closely with our strategy team as well on the dashboard and also to use that data to give us forecasts. What happens if we do nothing? You know, where are we going to be in five years time? What happens if we move around with the metrics? What happens if we um, can increase our recruitment? Um, and what happens if we promote? You know, how many women would we need to promote to get to um, 40% or get to 35%. Um, so looking, you know, doing this kind of modeling so that we can be aware, you know, um, doing nothing is going to just uh, give us the status quo. So um, what kinds of steps do we need to take? The, the other thing to say is that I work at the group level, but we're four businesses. We have Elsevier, which focuses on advancing science and health. Uh, LexisNexis Risk Solutions Group, which is focused on uh, protection of society, reducing inequalities through data. We have LexisNexis Legal and Professional, which is focused on advancing the rule of law and access to justice. And we also have one of the world's largest exhibitions businesses in read exhibitions where we focus on fostering communities. And so we have to be able to break the, the, the numbers down. We need to see it in the aggregate. But I can tell you that, um, you know, by having this data, it creates really great conversations. I had a chance to talk with our management team last week. Um, uh, our head of strategy was um, picking up this theme uh, before Christmas and talking with our CEOs. And so it's um, having the data allows them to see what's happening in their business. And we know that some parts of the business are um, moving at a faster pace and others will, will come along as well. But that allows them to set individual goals so that in the aggregate, we raise where we are today with where we want to be uh, in the longer term. Great. No, thanks for that. And thanks for adding the dimension of forecasting and uh, what if you do nothing versus what if you take action and, and what different outcomes will you get from that? And I think it's um, data is also a starting point for conversations. So we are not here to say that everybody has to start uh, on a perfect level. I, I think all of you have great uh, numbers to share, but that's not the point. The point is to, to actually know where you are um, on the journey and be able to assess where you're heading. And, and forecasting is a, is a part of that. <clears throat> so Mikael, um, Back to you, um, you have a different tool um, that is the job evaluation system that systematically and regularly evaluates the content of each job 
to understand what makes roles comparable and how equal pay can be measured. So can you talk a little bit more about that? I think that uh, gets deeper into one of the issues that we are trying to tackle uh, in the workplace. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, we want to wanted to work more regularly on this topic to uh, compare salaries and, and uh, look at the, the pay gap. Um, we also wanted to use a common approach for this across all our former home markets. Uh, I mentioned earlier that we had a, a Swedish legal requirement uh, as a background that we, we, we wanted to apply the same approach on, on all four home markets. Um, so we established a, a common job catalog, a common structure to uh, categorize the jobs, um, to level the jobs, uh, to make them um, comparable so we know what jobs uh, are compared to what. Uh, the whole model is, is based on predefined criteria. So, uh, the way you look at jobs, what are the requirements to perform the jobs, what are the responsibilities in the jobs, and so on. Uh, so different factors to 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 uh, clearly uh, define what the job is and uh, at what level the job is. Uh, so when we established that foundation, we had um, this data in place for all our employees in the HR system. Uh, the other part is uh, the importance of getting a process in place and the knowledge out throughout the organization to actually work with this and keep this up to date on a regular basis. The, the organization changes constantly. Uh, there are new jobs uh, coming up, there are jobs changing, there are new employees coming in, uh, employees leaving. So we have, have quite a, a lively set of data that we need to make sure uh, is uh, up to date and correct at all times. Uh, so every time we do uh, look at the data and, and the draw conclusions. We can trust the data and that it's correct. So the, the responsibility put out on, the, on all of the organization to really work with this and, and, and have knowledge in this was one important part of it. Uh, kind of a decentralized, decentralized uh, process and ownership uh, set up. Um, also, when, when we then had this in place, we do run uh, uh, regular reports uh, and, and also have KPIs set up for, for each of the members in the management team. So um, there are targets and there are reports uh, that are followed up on a, on a regular basis throughout the year. Um, so as soon as uh, you can see that there are actions that need to be taken, that the trends are moving in the wrong direction and so on, uh, you can more easily look through the data and see what may be causing this uh, and what actions do we need to, to mitigate this and, and actually close whatever gaps that, that may uh, occur because this is this is not something we we do and then we're done and ready and then we can close it. Uh, it's, it's a constant process and as I said everything is uh, changing constantly in a way so uh, as soon as we have a reorganization or, or we, we uh, employ a lot of people or, or uh, people go and so on, that there is, there is always different results at all times coming out. So uh, we monitor the trends, we, we uh, analyze the, the, the results and see what actions we need to take. And then also when we do take actions, uh, we can follow up and see uh, what were the results and, and was it what we expected and how do we adjust actions going forward to get the result we really looking for. Great. No, thank you so much. And I think it's a good point to, to just uh, point that out, that there's a lot of moving parts, uh, new people coming in, new roles being shaped and, and um, others that might be obsolete and how do you deal with that? So. Thanks. Anne-Marie, back to, to you. In terms of the KPIs that you're trying to hold your investees to account, and do you see that there's progress made because of, of this requirement? 
Yeah, well, that's an interesting question for a young DFI like us because we're only about three years old, not even three years old. Um, so it uh, and most of our investments actually happened in 2019, 2020. And on an annual reporting basis, we're only starting to get the first uh, most substantive results back. But so it might be a bit early to talk about change on the on the long term scale. But what we're seeing is is quite interesting. Um, so I think our, our in terms of our approach and, and what kind of core KPIs we, we chose to focus on, uh, for us it was important to be uh, quite uh, focused. Um, so because you know we have a, ideally we collect data on you know hundreds of, of data points and we'd be able to, to run cross analyses and all of that, but we uh, landed on, on a few core KPIs that we thought, okay, so these are the ones that we really need to track across the portfolio, uh, not only for us to measure our impact, but also to encourage and uh, track investees' performance on these, these core dimensions of women's economic empowerment, which is our focus. Um, and these are closely aligned with the 2x criteria uh, indicators. So uh, for all our investees, and they're actually quite similar to uh, many of the essential indicators in the new web. Uh, reporting framework, so the share of women uh, on boards in senior leadership across uh, all employees. Um, given our, our sectors of operation, we also look at the share of women on investment committees in the case of uh, private equity, the private equity uh, industry. And also when we have client facing or consumer facing uh, investees, uh, we also ask them to, to track the share of women uh, within the, the customers or, or consumers uh, of their business. And that particularly applies to, uh, to financial services uh, amongst others. Um, we also look at uh, amongst our core KPIs, we have some more qualitative um, uh, indicators, which we use to uh, get a sense of the investees, the client's intention, uh, the intentionality to um, uh, influence change uh, within their business on gender equality. So we look if, at, at if the client has any goals or uh, strategies, uh, action plans, uh, you know, do they have targets uh, on gender equality, or are they willing to adopt some? Because it's equally important to us it's perfectly fine if um, the, the client perhaps is not there yet, but with our help, they're willing to, to commit and to improve. So that's important to us. And we also look at the capacity. So is uh, does the investee have someone within the business who can take this on? Um, who can take this work forward? Are they willing to commit resources to it? So this tells us this we feel gives us a good baseline portrait of the of the this, of the situation at the company, but then it really depends. Go, going from there, uh, we really try to meet the client where they are, uh, and we have seen some cases where uh, the, the the client is quite advanced in their data collection. So we can go deeper uh, along some of the other essential KPIs of the of the WEPS framework, like the salary gap, like the promotion rates, like the um, attrition rates, uh, and that always uh, yields very, very interesting results. In some cases, given the markets where we work, given also sometimes the complexities, I mentioned private equity, sometimes we work through invest, uh, intermediaries, so the data is actually not even our investees, it's our investees' investees, so how do we deal with that added layer of complexity? Um, sometimes we we have to be patient and um, uh, work with the, the client to set up a, a data collection system that works for them and their business um, uh, business strategy and, and operations. And as an investor, we understand that it's, it's also on us to uh, help and support clients uh, building such systems and, and uh, tracking tracking that data. Um, so that's why we can use uh, resources like technical assistance, funding, um, and for us, impactful data is one of the core pillars of our technical assistance uh, practice. So we, we really look forward to, to pilot it. It's quite new, our technical assistance facility, so we look forward to piloting that, uh, that feature of impactful data with, with clients very soon. Um, and one thing I wanted to mention uh, that we've uh, that we've observed is um, an interesting trend. Is sometimes clients might think uh, might be a bit reluctant or, or might be a bit uh, 
uncomfortable or they don't know what will happen if they share some of this data uh, with us. And and really, um, and I totally, I totally get that. Um, but really, our, our approach, and I know it's the same for other two X members and with the the Web's framework as well, um, is that it's not about finding problems. <laughs> We're not asking this data to uh, to see where the problems are or to try to find uh, negative trends um, and, and then say you know, no to the investment or uh, have some negative consequences to that. The goal is really to just understand uh, where they are and it's not necessarily where about where you are, it's where you want to go. Um, and I think someone mentioned this earlier, to, to set these, these goals and, and understand where you're going, you first need to know what's in your uh, company, what's in your portfolio, what's the current, uh, the current state. So uh, it's really this, um, this approach that we're taking, uh, which, is, um, which is about the, the transformation, really. At the end of the day, it's about the change that you want to uh, promote within your, your business as an investor within your portfolio. Um, so we really look at it from that, um, for that perspective. Hmm. No, thank you. And I think um, if you have any examples of how it has eliminated some of this work, uh, both positive and negative, if you have something to add on that. Yeah, well, we, we just had recently a very interesting experience. Like I said, it's all very new, but... Uh, and I think it's Mikhail who mentioned, you know, sometimes it, the trend maybe doesn't go the way we, we'd like it to go, uh, but it's still a very interesting data point and it can be very informative uh, for the business. So we, we recently came across an example, it's an agribusiness uh, investee in Latin America. And when the re impact reporting came back, uh, we saw that there was a slight decrease in the share of women employees. Um, and so, okay, you know, what happened? And then we realized that it was because uh, they had switched crops. So they, the, they used to focus on a more berry type uh, of crop. I think it was grapes. So um, uh, the, the picking was very different than the new crop, which was uh, a tree-based uh, crop. So higher up, uh, you know, a different kind of, of physical labor. And what the company told us is that they heard from women workers that they they didn't want to do um, these jobs. They preferred to do uh, to work in, on other crops uh, that the company also um, also had. Um, so that was a you know it prompted very interesting questions. Okay, so then what about this particular job or this particular crop or picking technique makes this uh, difficult for women or not as um, appealing for women? Are there any improvements, whether it's about the training that is provided, the technique that is employed, or maybe some some equipment uh, that could make this uh, that could make this work easier, not just for women but for everybody? Uh, I think, in, at least in my experience, improvements that um, are perhaps perhaps originate from a, a gender equity uh, perspective end up benefiting everybody. So it could also make it easier for, for men and less demanding physically for, for men to do this, uh, this type of work. So like I said, it's still, we just found out about this. We still, the, the, we still need to um, uh, uh, see with the company what they want to do with this information. But I, I think it's a, it's a good case of even if the trend isn't going in the direction uh, perhaps they expected, it's still yielding some very uh, interesting trends and uh, results, which uh, have very practical implications for the um, uh, for the business. And I think this this type of data can also give some indication of where innovation is required, as as you just mentioned. Exactly. And in similar cases in the fishery sector, for example, where it's a lot of heavy labor, and and it could just be tweaked with with a much uh, easier lever for that with women and other men that might not be the uh, the ones that have been working on the fisher boats uh, could also, it opens up for more diversity and, and more inclusion of, of the labor market. So I think that these are in interesting and important questions to be asked. So Marcia, um, do you have any, uh, maybe not similar example, but an example that has illuminated uh, your situation in, in relics as a result of, of the data? Um, well, actually, I, I just want to pick up the point that you mentioned about innovation, because uh, I think it's really incumbent on all the 
the companies, uh, wherever they are on the journey, and it's a journey for us as it is for other companies, uh, to look at where your expertise lies and how you can maximize the positive impact on, on uh, gender equality uh, through your through the knowledge and skills that you have. So for us, um, because we're about content and data, uh, last year we put out our third gender report, and uh, listeners can find that on the free Relax SDP Resource Center. It's called the Researcher Journey Through a Gender Lens, and um, among the findings um, is that in every country over a five-year period that we looked at. Um, on average, women researchers author fewer publications than men, regardless of what authorship uh, position that they have. And another really striking statistic for me was about a proxy for innovation on patents. So during the period 2012 to 2016, women inventors and assignees um, appeared on patents less than men in every country um, that, that we looked at. And among inventors, the average number of patents that men apply for range from about 1.1 times more than women to up to one and a half times uh, more. And then in some cases, just on uh, women assignees related to patents, um, in one European country, in particular the Netherlands, uh, men applied for patents 3.1 times more than women. So. Um, what I'm, I'm citing here is that uh, you know we're about data and analytics, and so we're using this expertise to share knowledge of other women's journeys. Um, I also just want to flag that for International Women's Day last week, um, through the Relics SDG Resource Center, we made about 60 pieces of content available um, that highlight um, in different aspects of women and research, and I actually um, had a chance to do an interview with um, Dr. Marianne Legato, which you can find um, in that uh, right from the homepage, um, and she's a world-leading expert on um, looking at gender-specific medicine. So, um, you know, this is an example of something that, you know, we're really passionate about, and, you know, hopefully other companies you know, have something to contribute um, similarly by you know, using their expertise to share information or help to move the agenda forward. So I think this is a good example of looking at you know, what the data shows, but then um, it's incumbent on us, you know, these are where the gaps are. We also have to be um, part of the solution. So some examples of that, like at Elsevier, um, the Elsevier Foundation partners with the Organization for Women in Science for the Developing World, and in 2021, um, you know, we had um, awards recognizing a number of early career women scientists from 20 developing countries. So by showcasing them, by showcasing their work, uh, this is a, a way of us uh, trying to bridge that gap. And there's lots of other great examples. I'll just mention one more that um, we're a disseminating partner for the We Empower SDG Challenge which is celebrating women entrepreneurs, which the UN Global Compact has been, and the WEPs have been uh, supportive of. And again, it's just you know highlighting uh, and showcasing and supporting the work of, of women entrepreneurs who are helping to change the world, you know, where where they are. Thank you, thank you for uh, bringing up this example <clears throat> and for, for really emphasizing the importance of business being part of the solution. Um, I think this is very much what the, the women's empowerment principles are about because it covers both workplace internal issues, the marketplace and the community and how we can create that holistic um, approach to gender equality and women's empowerment. So Mikael, over to you if you have any example of how uh, this data has illuminated uh, gender equality or gender inequalities uh, on your side. Um, yeah, I'll refer to what Anne-Marie was saying too earlier that uh, you kind of learn a lot of, uh, you learn from mistakes or you learn from bad trends, uh, uh, but generally you you do uh, uh, learn a lot when we have the data in place and we can follow it up on a regular basis. We, we I think we moved more from trying to close the gaps to better understanding of what can cause the gaps and, and what actions do we need to take on those areas? How 
how do we work with recruitments or promotions and, and all of these decisions that are taken that actually affects the data and will eventually result in a pay gap if uh, there are any unbiased decisions taken or other factors in the, those processes that, that uh, kind of drives uh, possible pay gap. So it, it really gives us much more regular understanding of, of uh, our uh, organization, what happens, what what changes are, are, are uh, coming out of. Um, and uh, the other part, I think, is the accountability uh, to, to uh, the entire organization, the uh, distributed accountability there where everyone uh, out there can feel uh, the responsibility uh, of this topic together, that we are on top of this at all times. Um, one another thing that is related to this is that we took the entire uh, model of data with, with uh, uh, the job uh, evaluation and, and what type of jobs every employee had and, and what level the job was and made it uh, visible to all the employees so they they know what what uh, classification they have what the job is uh, we also took the salary ranges and made them visible to, to all of the employees so they can see the same information as the managers can see uh, and evaluating both the job and, and uh, the salary for, for the job. So it, it, it gives us the possibility to move forward and make these changes as well. So I think uh, there's a lot of good consequences of, of uh, putting all of this in place. Yeah, and no, I think for, for also adding the dimension of transparency. So it is also to involve stakeholders such as employees to know where they are in the system and and how different jobs are classified. So I think that's that's a very good point on, on the transparency. Um, I wanted to check if there are any questions from participants before we go into our last questions on some recommendations for everyone. I've seen that uh, I'd like to thank Odd and, and Megan uh, from Global Compact that have diligently put some, some great links uh, along with your conversations. So we have uh, the case studies uh, from both Relix and, and uh, Swedbank on the uh, on the chat box. Um, there has been a few questions in relation to um, uh, the transcript, and uh, as mentioned earlier, we will be uh, putting it out on webs.org um, the the conversation, and uh, we also have, of course, our, our webs for sure that lays out the the transparency and accountability framework in more detail. Um, I wonder if there's any other questions at this point. Otherwise, I'd like to move to the to the last. Uh, questions for the three panelists about recommendations to other companies. What would you suggest, either somebody embarking completely fresh on this today or somebody that has already a few data points uh, being collected, but any any recommendations that you have to, to participants and anyone else who will be listening to this conversation? Uh, who would like to start? I think, Marcia, you look that you have a good recommendation lined up. Uh, well, you know, just what I was saying before, we definitely don't have all the answers um, and we want to continue to improve. But um, one one bit of experience, um, so I lead our uh, corporate responsibility function and um, we started on inclusion oh, 10, 10 years ago, but it wasn't until we actually got more colleagues involved. And one of the ways that we did this, I mean, obviously employee resource groups are incredible and, you know, our women's connected networks. And, um, but when we, um, when we actually went to senior leadership and, and when we went to other parts of the business, like engaging with our procurement colleagues on developing a, um, inclusive supplier program, which focuses on uh, women owned businesses, as well as other uh, businesses by um, underrepresented uh, suppliers, 
you know, it's it's not it means that it's not linear anymore. Um, it's going to be more challenging because uh, there's a lot more stakeholders that are going to be involved. But the result is ultimately better because more people feel engaged and more people buy in. Um, and so I think, you know, having the conversations throughout the organization and recognizing that, you know, uh, where we are today doesn't have to be where we can be in the future. Um, so it's uh, it's it's been exciting, uh, and you know we just want to continue to raise that bar higher as we go. Thank you, uh, Anne Marie. Well, I think the the first thing I would just you know uh, re-emphasize. Remember, it's not about where you are; it's where you're going. So don't be uh, afraid to to see what comes up or, or to dig deeper into um, uh, into the data. Um, also, I guess you know it might be obvious, but invest in a in a good system. So some of the things that we're we're seeing. So sometimes companies or investees will have the data, but they might not be able to cross reference it. Or um, so you know they might have the data on um, the share of women as uh, let's say for a financial institution, women who receive loans. Uh, and they might have data on non-performing loans, but not gender disaggregated. So they can't uh, see if there are any gender trends there. So it's really worth thinking about this um, as early as early as you can. Um, from someone who's really starting, uh, I think it, I know it can be overwhelming you know, which indicators to choose. What do we have to track? Uh, and the good thing is that there's um, already a lot of um, resources out there and there's a lot of efforts on the parts of many organizations like development finance institutions like the 2x challenge like UN women and the web framework to harmonize um, some of those definitions and that data so uh, there's a lot of information uh, online the web's resource is a great one I'll put in the chat a bit later the links to the 2x challenge resources so that might be a good place to start um, and yeah, good rule of thumb, I think, is when in doubt, <laughs> disaggregate the data. You know, if it's about people uh, and, and you have the opportunity to do it, disaggregate. Try to see if you can collect gender disaggregated data because you might find some interesting, uh, interesting trends and, and insights for your business. Yeah, no, thanks for bringing that up, Anne-Marie, about uh, correlating different data points. Uh, what we uh, I observed in, in one with web signatory was that they had data on uh, the promotions of the year and uh, also on the performance reviews. And you could the trend was that the performance reviews were uh, women had generally better reviews but didn't get the promotions. So those are the kind of findings that you can get if you start cross correlating uh, the data as well. So not just collecting them linearly but try to see the, the trends from from different aspects so exactly yeah so that thanks for bringing that in uh Mikkel, do you have any recommendations for us um i think i've maybe been into it before uh, but so maybe it sounds like i'm a bit repetitive but uh, really establish a, a process that involves uh, the entire organization uh, and, and, uh, and to make sure that everyone is well informed and, and uh, knows about the, uh, the whole process and, and this topic it's uh, because you, you need to maintain the data um, uh, at least if we're talking about the type of data we, we, we have uh, been, been uh, managing now then it, it needs to be um, it needs to be maintained it's easy to run a project and put this in place and then it, it doesn't age well so to say uh, so that that's one part of it, and and, uh, um, and uh, the ownership out in the organization as well uh, on the outcome of it, and, and taking actions uh, when there are are actions needed and the results uh, are shown that that there are improvements uh, that needs to be made. So um, the the ownership all the way from the top down to to, to every single manager and, and possibly the employee as well. Great. No, I, I think thanks. Thanks for that, Mikael. It's important to really emphasize uh, the systematic collection of data, and it's not a one-off. And have a system that really supports uh, is is very very important. So thanks everyone for uh, your uh, feedback. I see also here on intersectionality. 
is important. Um, Marcia, do you want to say something about intersectionality uh, before we close? Yeah, I think we can't lose sight yeah. of the, the different aspects of um, diversity and um, ensuring that you know we're we're collecting a full suite of of data. Um, you know, and and one of the challenges that we have is that in some places um, it's really difficult to get that data, and we have to look at the ways that we can do that. So we have a big project that we are embarking on. It's going to be a multi-year project around self-identification. And we've recognized that, you know, we could go out right away and just say, okay, um, in other markets, for example, in Europe, give us this information. But if we don't actually make the case about why it's important and we don't bring the organization along with us, we're going to get really paltry uh, data back. So we really want to take our time and 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 get this right, so that we get a fuller picture, um, you know, uh, related to sexual identity and um, and on race and ethnicity and disability. So we we really need to look at this as you know part of a full picture of the you know the beautiful uh, um, diversity that we have within our organization. Thanks for, for adding that. So um, it is not only about women and men, but also who are those women and men and make sure that um, the, the company really understand who are the employees and how can they be supported. And uh, as we heard earlier, uh, it can help start conversations on um, identifying different initiatives and programs that can really help um, the surfacing uh, some of those issues. So th thanks for that. Um, I think we have come to the closing and uh, I would like to thank all of you. We will continue this conversation uh, in April, so we will post information about the webs number seven, which focuses on uh, accountability and transparency. And we will have a, a webinar on the 7th of April um, that will focus on this topic as well, because it's very important and I hope that everyone can continue. Um, thinking about these issues and, and taking action towards uh, better collection of data on gender equality. I'd also like to thank once again uh, the UN Global Compact team for having given us this opportunity and um, also uh, in terms of where do we start, where does a company start on the journey is a good starting point with a gap analysis tool to really kind of get understanding on where you are, what policies do you have in place and what uh, can you be doing. And then once you are well on your journey, we expect you to come. It's no obligation, as Diana mentioned earlier, to report, but we really hope that um, we will foster uh, transparency around this figure. And it's not about pointing at the negative, but just to show that you're a committed uh, company that drives in, in uh, towards gender equality and women's empowerment. So thanks Anne-Marie, Mikkel and Marcia for uh, adding all this wealth of experience to the conversation and uh, thanks to everyone that have participated.